Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to our talk. My name is Sahiti Ailu. Here is my colleague Arun Krishna Kumar. Both of us are engineers from VMware. Today we are going. Yeah. Today we are going to share our experience um, on building cluster API infrastructure provider for a multi-tenant cloud platform. Uh, we will also be talking about few of the challenges that we have faced along the way, lessons learned, and uh, discoveries made around few of the problems that we have identified that one could see in their environments, and also um, era, uh, design patterns around cluster API usage in multi-tenant cloud platform. Lastly, we'll be covering on uh, how we have actually built Kubernetes as a service layer with the underlying technology of cluster API. With that, let's get started. Um, so agenda for, us, for, for the first half of the talk, I will be covering on cluster API internals and uh, will also be um, giving you some resource on, resources on how to get started with the implementation. For the second half, Arun will be covering on design patterns around cluster API usage in the context of multi-tenant cloud environment. And lastly, we'll be covering on Kubernetes as a service layer on multi-tenant cloud. Okay, before getting into the details of cluster API, uh, I would like all of us to have a common understanding on what multi-tenant cloud is. So cloud basically delivers infrastructure as a service to its tenants in terms of compute, storage, networking, uh, while providing strict isolation to its tenants and also the security. So then who are the tenants here? Tenants could be an end individual user, but in this particular case, in our cloud platform, this multi-tenant cloud platform, which is VMware Cloud Director, uh, that's our product's name. So the tenant is an organization. It's an enterprise level company with group of users. And there can exist multiple organizations within this cloud platform. And these users can request for Kubernetes clusters. And this is the solution that we have built at large that is uh, a Kubernetes as a service engine on top of multi-tenant cloud platform with the underlying technology of cluster API. Okay, so what is cluster API? I'm gonna quickly breeze through this slide. The cluster API is a Kubernetes project to bring declarative Kubernetes style APIs for cluster creation, configuration, and management. So the idea here is that, so end users would run these commands which are uh, kubectl traditional familiar commands to create the cluster on a, an existing cluster. So this existing cluster with cluster API components installed is what is called management cluster. And the children clusters that are created as a result are called workload clusters. So that's the difference between management and workload cluster. So management cluster is cluster with core CAPI components installed and this is where API definitions of workload clusters are also defined. And workload clusters are intended to host the modern uh, workloads. Okay, so that's the end user's point of view on what cluster API is. Now let's uh, see the developer's point of view on what cluster API is. So in simpler terms, cluster, cluster API is comprised of one main component that is core CAPI provider and three pluggable components, infrastructure provider, bootstrap provider, and control plane provider. So all these providers have their own set of responsibilities to adhere, uh, to meet, and a uh, few orchestration rules to adhere, which are dictated by the core CAPI provider. So at high level, the infrastructure provider responsibility is to create the necessary infrastructure required for the cluster on the chosen cloud environment. And this is what we are interested in for this talk. And bootstrap provider's responsibility is to uh, generate a script that can convert any machine into a Kubernetes either control plane or worker node. Control plane provider's responsibility is to manage control plane nodes and uh, deal with upgrades, etc. Okay, so the so then the idea here is that user would come in, apply a cluster manifest file on this management cluster, and the resultant workload clusters get created on the chosen infrastructure provider. So for this talk, uh, so this CAP VCD is what we have built, cluster API provider for VMware Cloud Director, 
and VCD is the acronym that stands for our multi-tenant cloud platform that is VMware Cloud Director. Here is the sample CAPI manifest file. Um, so cluster, so basically it's a hierarchical structure of API objects and the cluster is at the root, ele it, it's the root element of the other objects and it holds owner refs to few other uh, objects associated with other, uh, other providers. Note these um, VCD cluster and VCD machine template custom resources. These are associated with our infrastructure provider that's CAP VCD and uh, you'll be actually replacing those with uh, whatever the infrastructure uh, CRs that you'll be coming up for your infrastructure provider. So this sample CAPI manifest say, uh, basically says, I want a Kubernetes cluster with one control plane and one worker, ca one worker node with so-and-so settings on so-and-so uh, cloud provider. Let's uh, go a bit deeper now to see how cluster API works. What enables smooth interplay of core CAPI and all the other providers that we have just talked about? Number one, hierarchy of API objects, and number two, cluster API contract. So, um, hierarchy of API objects. The diagram that you are seeing here is the pictorial representation of what we have just seen in the previous slide, um, the cluster API manifest file. And everything that's in blue here are uh, custom resources associated with uh, core CAPI and other providers and that are in green are associated with the infrastructure provider, which is of our interest. And when you apply that YAML file, this is how the resultant API object hierarchy is gonna look like. And all of these resources are being watched by their associated controllers to bring, uh, so they are basically doing continuous reconciliation attempts to bring the, uh, their current state to the desired state. So similarly, we have these, oh sorry. So we have these infra cluster and infra machine objects that are created as a result. And these are also be, uh, are supposed to be watched by the respective controllers like infra cluster and infra machine controllers. And this is what uh, we are supposed to build as part of the cluster infrastructure provider. So these CRDs and their associated controllers at the minimum is what would make the infrastructure provider. Okay, so now that we have a fair understanding of what um, hierarchy of API object is gonna look like, let's understand cluster API contract. So as I've mentioned before, all these controllers from the providers are responsible uh, to do certain things and um, all of these need to adhere to certain orchestration rules dictated by the main component that is core CAPI. And these controllers are supposed to interact with each other by variables called well-known fields. And let's take an example of how cluster controller and how in infra cluster controller interact with each other uh, in the sequence diagram. So both of these controllers are watching um, watching their associated CR uh, custom resources here. So the cluster co controller is the first one to act here. It sets the owner ref on the infra cluster. So basically it says, I kind of own you that. An infra cluster controller's job from that point onwards is to create the basic infrastructure for the cluster creation to proceed further. Um, like it can create a load balancer on networking setup that's unique to your own cloud environments. And it also need to ensure that control point endpoint is either generator or specified by the user. So once the control plane endpoint is generated, it sets itself to, uh, as ready. And then cluster controller would consume that control plane endpoint and marks itself ready and it generates the cube, conf cube configs secret so that end users can access, uh, begin to access that cluster. Okay. So infra machine controller is mainly responsible for creating nodes. So in the previous slide, what we have seen is infra cluster controller. That was the one that created the basic infrastructure necessary for all of these controllers to proceed further. And infra machine controller, um, Main, main job is to create the necessary infrastructure and at the same time bootstrap controller uh, 
generates the necessary script to convert these machines into Kubernetes nodes. So a bootstrap controller generates the bootstrap script and stores it in a well-known field in a data secret that is to be consumed by machine controller. Machine controller kind of um, copies it to an another field which is to be read by infra machine controller. And infra machine controller at this point provisions the necessary infrastructure using that bootstrap secret. Basically, it takes out the cloud init script from that secret and runs it to convert the machine into a Kubernetes node, either control plane or worker node node. And if it's a control plane node, you would also see another uh, controller in the picture that is KCP controller. Okay. So once that is all done, infra machine controller marks itself ready and then machine controller also marks itself ready and it waits for the node to join the cluster. So the bottom line here is that Again, the CRD is associated with these uh, infra cluster machine and uh, associated controllers would what make up the infrastructure provider and this is what we need to implement as cluster API infrastructure provider. Okay, so now that we have a fair understanding on how internals work, let's get started with the implementation. And implementation should become relatively easy and it, it should all, the understanding on the cluster API internals should also help you to um, debug and troubleshoot when things do not go as expected. We have used Cube Builder command, Cube Builder to actually um, create the project layout and the scaffolding. Cube Builder is the framework that generates um, APIs, Kubernetes APIs via custom resource definitions. And it will also generate a lot of boilerplate code for you. You can just jump in and uh, implement the business logic. Okay, so now let's assume that we have uh, built the infrastructure provider for your, uh, for your own cloud environments. Now, so now how do we get this infrastructure provider implemented on the cl Kubernetes cluster? So basically we need to set up the management cluster. And we can achieve that by cluster cuttle tool that helps setting up the management cluster and generating cluster manifest files. So this is the command that you need to run for your infrastructure. VCD is our platform. So basically this command pulls the content from your GitHub repo and installs those components on the management cluster. So what this also means that you will have to update or edit cluster cuttle code to include your infrastructure provider as, list in, as part of uh, the huge list of other uh, providers that cluster cuttle currently supports. And these are cluster cuttle generate commands to um, generate the sample cluster API manifests, which you can run on the management cluster to create workload clusters. And next, um, okay, so now we have this management cluster fully ready with all the components installed. User would come in and create the workload cluster. Now, are these workload clusters ready? Not yet. So ready as in ready to host modern applications, not yet. So we need CNI to enable container communication. CPI to set provider ID on the nodes. Note that CPI is kind of a mandatory requirement um, from core CAPI. So it expects cloud provider inter interface to be installed on your workload clusters. So, so we need to have the CNI and CPI installed on the workload cluster to be called fully ready. And uh, CSI is to enable state de stateful deployments for persistent volumes. And we use CRS cluster resource set definitions for installing these components. So if you're planning to uh, build cluster API infrastructure provider, you should also plan to implement cloud provider interface for your cloud environment. Okay, so admission controllers and multi-version API. So now that we have the basic implementation of cluster API infrastructure provider, you can make it more robust by implementing these admission controllers, defaulting and validating webhooks. Um, basically, they, they let you write custom code to um, either set some default values on the resources and validate before the data is persisted in the HCD database. And next, multi-version API support, it's a to big topic in itself. For this talk, I'm just going to go over the need and the few resources to get started. Um, so at some point, you'll have to think about bumping up API version. And 
what this means is it becomes a necessity on the infrastructure provider to be backward compatible with older API versions. Again, so when user uh, requests for an older API version, Kubernetes API server is supposed to return the object in that API version. However, your stored version could be much ahead and Kube API server needs to uh, do the necessary conversions between the desired version and the stored version. And these conversions need to go into conversion webhooks so that Kube API server can actually call them uh, to do the necessary conversions. So you can create the scaffolding for these uh, webhooks also using Kube Builder, and we have used the same. So a few, few of the lessons learned. Uh, so the Docker provider is an excellent starting point to read through and modify the code, which is what we have actually used uh, in the beginning to uh, familiarize ourselves with the infrastructure provider implementation. It's very simple. And Bootstrap controller, it generates a cloud init script in Jinja template. Um, we had to do some tinkering to adjust it to our needs. And load balancers are kind of a first class component of the infrastructure. And I have men already talked about CPI. And uh, do remember to, um, oh, where is it? Um, yeah, for the, C yeah, here. Uh, sorry, sorry, this uh, thing needs to go in here. So we need, do, we need to remember to set the cloud provider as external for the kubelet configuration. Um, yeah, and so lastly, um, on this page, so these two labels, take, do take note of these labels. These need to be set on your CRDs. This is an important step. This basically tells cluster a core component core CAPI component to use which API version of your infrastructure provider. And it becomes even more important to set these two fields uh, when you have multi-version API support in your infrastructure ready. So we actually uh, hit this issue um, where we had this multi-version API support ready and we, some, we kind of uh, forgot to set these labels. And our newer API version resources are somehow getting reset to the older content. So we had no clue why, thanks to cluster, cap, cluster API folks who helped us debug. And it's a simple change, but this is very important thing that you need to remember. OK, lastly, uh, auto scaling kind of comes for free with the cluster API. All you have to do is uh, download this and uh, run this command with cluster API as a cloud provider and set some annotations on the machine deployment object. So there are more references to um, here and um, your clusters are auto-scalable. So with that, I'll hand it over to Arun. Yeah. Thank you. Hi. Uh -huh. Thanks, Sahiti. So, uh... Yeah, let's uh, move from here. So as you see, there, is a, there are lots of gotchas. Uh, the cluster API documentation is one, but um, as she mentioned, the labels and so on are, uh, uh, it's tough to find them in the documentation. The documentation is like a 350 page book if you print it out, and uh, the labels are mentioned in some particular cases, and uh, it is tough to uh, debug these as well. But uh, the cluster API uh, community is very supportive, and um, we made use of uh, their help quite a bit. So now let's uh, reiterate on, uh, uh, revisit how the VMware, how the cloud provider multi-tenancy looks like, uh, how a public, I mean, uh, how a, in general any multi-tenancy looks like and how a VMware Cloud Director fits into that model. So uh, in a VMware Cloud Director, we follow the uh, principle of uh, the Google private cloud equivalent, though the other mechanism is also possible. You can have a set of organizations, org one and org two and so on. So does this. Right. So, you, uh, for example, suppose there are two organizations, org1 and org2. The cloud is uh, partitioned into these organizations in terms of compute, network, storage, and so on. So each of them is like a set of uh, virtual uh, data centers uh, from the cloud. They are carved out, and each uh, org has their own set of um, uh, data centers and their own set of resources. Now, the IDP is also carved out in the sense that uh, Org1 users, uh, they do not really know the existence of Org2, for example, and Org1 administrators also do not know the identity of Org2. There is an Uber cloud provider who is at the top who can potentially see everything, but uh, the identity, I mean, the IDP is uh, unique across all of the orgs. Uh, 
Now, uh, we, this is a very rich uh, multi-tenant system. Now, uh, we wanted to figure out what our goals were for VMware Cloud Director and what cluster API brings, the, uh, brings forward and how do we marry the two pretty much. So on, uh, our goals are that uh, tenant users or organization users, they should be able to create a cluster API in a self-service manner. So a self-service manner is started because we'll talk about that uh, in, the, in a little bit. Uh, self-service is very important for us. The second part is to bring out the features of our cloud platform, VMware Cloud Director. Uh, into Kubernetes clusters. So um, we have very strong uh, uh, user isolation and uh, quota systems and uh, roles and rights. Uh, whereas uh, Kubernetes has its own RBAC system, the quota system of Kubernetes is, uh, has a lot to be desired. I mean, it has one authentication mechanism and it has a separate auth mechanism and the two don't uh, uh, talk to each other pretty much. So uh, uh, we, I mean, and um, yeah, we are left wanting there. So we wanted to be able to actually represent our user in the Kubernetes cluster. So uh, the third part is uh, the same uh, thing about representation. So we want to ensure that our tenant users can be represented using their own IDPs in the Kubernetes clusters. So they must be able to authenticate, they must be able to uh, create a cluster, but within the cluster, they must be able to show their identity. And the fourth thing is that we wanted to administer cloud policies on the user from the cloud side but this should also flow into Kubernetes operations. So if a user has uh, access to create only say 10 VMs, we want to ensure that the nodes, the Kubernetes nodes when they are auto scaling, they shouldn't scale beyond 10, they should stop at 10. And uh, that should be a policy which is enforced by the cloud and that should automatically be used by uh, the clusters. So on, then we actually came up with a set of uh, questions. Now, um, uh, how do we actually, first of all, satisfy the network requirements? So, uh, one hidden thing of cluster API, or it is potentially evident now, is that uh, the management and workload clusters all need to talk to each other all of the time. There needs to be a network connectivity. Whereas you saw that uh, the orgs were disjoint with respect to network in the other case. So how do you actually uh, have a network connectivity between a management cluster and a workload cluster? Maybe you cannot start off with one Uber management cluster. The uh, second thing is uh, who creates the management cluster and manages it? So uh, potentially there must be somebody who uh, does the lifecycle of the management cluster and keeps it secure. If uh, the management cluster, for example, handles a thousand workload clusters, right? Um, there's also a skew of versions between the management and workload clusters. So at some point, uh, if you want to upgrade the workload cluster, you will also have to upgrade the management cluster. So there is some amount of management task and the uh, administrator of this cluster needs to be Kubernetes savvy. So that is on the cluster management side. On the user management side, how do the users uh, create workload clusters in a self-service manner? So uh, the user needs to know that there is a management cluster and they need to go and ask for some access to it and do it. So it's not very self-service. Basically, there has to be somebody who is on the management cluster side who is helping them out. Uh, how do we enforce the tenant boundaries on the user side? Basically, how do we represent the user? Uh, and so that is the next two things. And uh, finally, how do we audit the user actions on the cloud side? Uh, the user may go and do some uh, Kubernetes actions, but they have to be audited with respect to their own user ID. So to solve the user aspect, we made the user a first-class citizen inside Kubernetes. So what the user would do is uh, they would be able to ask for a token from the cloud and get a refresh token and embed it as a secret in their token. So what I'm talking about from now on is sort of uh, patterns in multi-tenant clusters which uh, exist in other providers and other uh, systems but they are not really documented or there is no clear uh, acceptance of those as a pattern. So basically we are talking about what we did and uh, uh, these seem to be the common patterns which are being used nowadays. So one of them is um, representation of the user using their secrets. I mean, in AWS it is uh, mounting the secrets and so on. Uh, so that way you can actually enforce the policies of the cloud director on uh, the particular user. So the user would just uh, embed their secret into the cluster which they create and they use the token in secrets. So we had to build a refresh token methodology in order to get this, So because uh, we didn't want to expose the user's credentials directly. Uh, that is like a, a token which can be revoked pretty much. Uh, so the other thing is that the network boundary. We have seen that there can be multiple organizations. Uh, as a result, there can be multiple uh, um, management, uh, I mean, there needs to be a one management uh, cluster per organization. And uh, there has to be uh, workload clusters uh, connected to that particular org itself. So this wall is pretty much a network boundary. And uh, since uh, management and workload clusters need to talk to each other, they have to be within the same networking space, which is uh, the same tenant. The user would essentially use their access token and uh, do it. However, this uh, also needs a namespace level multi-tenancy. Uh, 
uh, for which we take uh, Kubernetes as help. And uh, uh, the reason is in the next slide. So as you can see, uh, like Sahiti mentioned, the tenant can apply a Kubernetes YAML to the management cluster and get a workload cluster. However, they should not be able to uh, view the other clusters. So their access should not flow into this. But uh, how do you manage that? Because uh, pretty much the tenant needs some access, right? So here we are, uh, uh, so, and the third part is that uh, the management cluster should not have a long time access to the cluster's credentials. So we solved that using uh, namespaces. So what happens is uh, the each tenant gets their own namespace, each tenant user gets their own namespace, and uh, they are able to access only objects within that namespace, and they can create workload clusters within that namespace. Uh, however, this still does not, uh, yeah, the other part is that uh, they need to have short uh, 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 expiry, I mean, not refresh tokens with uh, short expiry times. And I'll come to that next when we are doing a self-service Kubernetes, or if you are doing this in the complete uh, schedule. So this namespace pretty much uh, gives uh, exactly this tenant user access to uh, all cluster objects and uh, VCD cluster objects and so on, a subset of objects. So now let us uh, quickly look at uh, how the workflow would uh, be like. So you have, suppose uh, there is a Alice management user and a tenant Alice user, and uh, this user wants to actually go and um, um, uh, crea uh, create a workload cluster. So how do they first of all discover that there is an Alice management cluster? So there is no discovery and uh, somehow we have to get to know of it from, uh, by word of mouth. But uh, once uh, this particular uh, tenant uh, uh, gets the cluster, uh, gets to know of the cluster, then they actually figure out who the owner of the cluster is, the management cluster admin, and they ask for a management cluster access. So this is a human operation which happens. This management cluster now creates a namespace for this user and gives them a particular cube config, which is uh, the way to access this particular cluster. And uh, now, the tenant, uh, so as you can see, the management uh, cluster admin's work is done. They can just go out of the picture. Now the Alice management cluster is available, the namespace is available, the user is still there, and the cube config is still there. Now they want to create a cluster. So they will create a cluster with uh, the VCD token embedded as a secret. Uh, the VCD is our cloud provider refresh token, um, this particular token. And they get a workload cluster created using that. They can monitor the lifetime of this creation and uh, they can see it getting created. Uh, now again, so seeing it getting created is a bit of a tricky thing because they don't have access to cap VCD logs. Okay, so it is not, uh, I mean, we have to make the logs multi-tenant in a particular way by which they can actually see if there is an issue with the uh, creation and then they can go ahead and create it. Now, once that is created, uh, so as in they should not be able to see any other user's logs. So that is why the logs also need to be multi-tenant at that particular point. Once the cluster is created, they want, uh, they want to actually get the cube config of that cluster, the admin cube config. And uh, that is the means by which they own the cluster, right? So they would issue a get cube config. It's a small script which they can run, which would essentially uh, take uh, the secrets from the cluster and uh, you get back this particular uh, workload cluster. And uh, things are done there. Later when they want to, uh, update or upgrade this particular cluster, they again need to come to this particular management cluster and make those changes and uh, their operations are satisfied. So this is the whole set of operations. And as you can see, there are uh, many things in this lifecycle and it's not very uh, self-service based, right? You actually go and talk to a person and do many things. There are other things with the management cluster as well, which we need to talk about in a distributed system. And uh, that is the blast radius and uh, security aspects of, of it. So you have a management cluster which is handling multiple workload clusters, and uh, you have multiple workload clusters where the users have actually uh, stored their secrets, their uh, uh, tokens. Now what happens if there's a network partition on the management cluster side? Now the workload clusters cannot be managed at that point. You cannot upgrade or update them. So they are sort of uh, waiting for the management cluster to come back up or the network uh, system to be there. Or what happens if the management cluster is compromised in some way or becomes evil? Now, all of the uh, tokens are uh, compromised. I mean, even if they have short-lived tokens, they cannot use the management cluster anymore in order to upgrade their clusters. So they are in a sort of a limbo state, wherein uh, they can, we can always revoke the tokens, that is fine, but then you can't uh, go and uh, do anything to your cluster. You can just uh, let the current workloads, runs, uh, workloads run. Even auto-scaling will not uh, happen at that particular point. So uh, in order to actually uh, solve this issue, we actually, uh, came up with something, I mean, we actually began to use something called a self-managing cluster. Uh, so this is an old concept which has existed from the beginning of cluster API. However, it is uh, not uh, 
uh, used as a common pattern nowadays. Uh, however, this has helped us quite a bit. So you have the same system wherein you have the management cluster, you have uh, CAP VCD binaries, and you have the workload cluster records, the CRDs, which Saitim was mentioning, infra, infra cluster controller and so on. And uh, the, ten, uh, the user can actually apply uh, resize and upgrade commands on this management cluster and things work. So what we do is we, uh, and uh, things uh, operate on the workload cluster. What we do is we actually install CAPI and CAPVCD on the workload cluster and uh, we run the cluster control move command. So the move command can be namespace. So you can exactly move uh, those uh, records of this cluster into the workload cluster. All of the labeled objects which uh, Sahiti mentioned, uh, those would uh, potentially move. Once these are moved, as you can see, this link between the management cluster and the workload cluster is lost. And you can actually apply uh, uh, all of your commands on this. So what we have done is, after the cluster has been uh, made self-managing, so this sort of a cluster is called a self-managing cluster. Once it becomes self-managing, you can uh, just uh, 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 auto-scale it by just using its own record. So you can do a kubectl up, um, you can change the number of nodes, for example, uh, worker nodes from three to five, and you can apply the YAML on this particular workload cluster, it will scale itself up. Uh, likewise, you can, it can scale down as well, and you can also do a upgrade operation. So you can actually let it uh, upgrade itself from one version to another. It's completely self-managing. The only caveat is for deletion. For deletion, we need to take the help of another cluster. Uh, and uh, we have an, a way around that. And we began to use this on um, uh, self-service Kubernetes cluster. So now uh, we want to have one SaaS layer by which uh, you can create a cluster in a networking space where you can't have access. So there is a networking space somewhere which has 192.168.something, uh, for example, in uh, 10 in Pepsi or 10 in Coke. You have a 192.168 uh, network here. Now, there is a particular uh, Kubernetes as a service layer and a Pepsi user. He cannot access the network of tenant Pepsi directly. He is on his laptop. But however, he can access uh, API surface and they want to, uh, I mean, he or she, and uh, uh, this user wants to be able to uh, run a particular command by which they can actually create a cluster here. So the way we do that is uh, we make use of the bootstrap cluster mechanism so basically, we create a VM on that. So by using uh, the cloud uh, provider's uh, API, I mean, by using the cloud API, we create a VM on that particular tenant, and we actually create a small bootstrap cluster in that. And then we create a workload cluster based on that, and we move the objects. We make it self-managing. I mean, we install uh, uh, CAPI, CAPVCD, and we make it self-managing. And then we destroy the bootstrap cluster. At this point, the uh, Pepsi user can actually go and manage their workload clusters on, I mean, manage their cluster on their own. So there is no intermediate layer, there is no management cluster, there is no overhead of another person coming and administrating one cluster, and uh, there is no scaling of requests. So what happens if one management cluster is uh, handling 10,000 uh, other workload clusters? How do you actually ensure that it uh, scales up and works? You don't have any of those questions. You have each uh, Pepsi user, I mean, each user accessing their own uh, um, Kubernetes cluster, and uh, the KAS, uh, Kubernetes as a service layer at this point is uh, just a very thin wrapper. And uh, we ultimately came up with that and completed, uh, I mean, we have finished the implementation of that and we are going to release that as uh, CSE 4.0. Uh, there are, I mean, other users can also come and create their own self-managing clusters. Now it's uh, extremely uh, distributed, as in it's uh, embarrassingly parallel, right? So there's no central authority which is actually trying to manage multiple clusters, but each cluster is managing itself. All of the requests are directly flowing to that. And uh, shout outs, yeah, the, thanks a lot, uh, CAPI community for the help, and uh, uh, Giant Swarm and some, of, uh, some other partners actually give us uh, some requests and uh, uh, make us uh, uh, make CAPI CD better and implement features better. So uh, there are some references here and uh, a QR code, but uh, if there are any questions, uh, we can take. So these are the common patterns. The reason why we have mentioned it is uh, when you go to the community and ask for it, there is no fixed set saying that, hey, this is the way to do it. It is like uh, some people have done it this way, some people have done it that way. And, this. and uh, so this presentation is a very commonly used pattern to do. Any questions or comments? Otherwise, we are sort of at time or beyond time. Okay, good. Three or six. Yeah.